wouldn't it be great if Alzheimer's disease could be treated with exercise? So we um, have just discussed loosely under the same umbrella depression and anxiety, which are cognitive sort of disorders, and that exercise can be beneficial uh, for minimizing symptoms and keeping those symptoms minimized long term. So that's what we just finished discussing. So wouldn't it be nice if we could turn our attention to other cognitive disorders, Alzheimer's being one of the more um, uh, common and terrible of those, certainly as you reach old age uh, in recent years. So is there any protection afforded by exercise for Alzheimer's or other aspects of aging? Now, because we talked about aging next, or, or being a discussion for next week, loosely, Aging in general is characterized by the deterioration of many systems and the, um, the appearance of many diseases. Uh, getting older is probably the biggest risk factor for any chronic disease, which is a switch in how we think about it. You might think of, well, sedentary lifestyle as a risk factor for diabetes or high saturated fat intake is a risk factor for hypertension, something like that. Aging really is the biggest risk factor for any chronic disease. If you give it enough time, it seems that a lot of these age-related diseases will pop up eventually. They seem to be somewhat inevitable, no matter how healthy you are and how long you can fight them off. So with that dark cloud hanging over our head, aging is generally characterized by many diseases. We're starting to try to understand and unravel the process of aging, Alzheimer's being one of the diseases that appears with aging. Aging might be on purpose, it might be part of a program, which generally is, it only happens if it's a good thing. It's hard to understand from our perspective as we grow why aging and deterioration and death might be a good thing, but aging seems to follow a program, so if we can figure that out, that gives us understanding about aging in general, and then a little bit of a hope for therapies to perhaps prolong the quality of life, if not the quantity. We can look at cellular mechanisms and different tissues, um, and instead of focusing on treating the individual's diseases with this now bigger picture approach, as they are all part of the concept of aging, maybe we can treat aging, and as a secondary effect, treat these underlying diseases. It was kind of interesting. Um, so from a funnel approach, large and zeroing in on, um, on Alzheimer's disease, aging involves a large decline in function across many different systems. And to plot them generally on this slide over time, as you get older, your peak abilities or performances tend to be in the early 30s, late 20s, uh, and then systems decline overall across the lifespan. Nerve conduction velocity, heart rate, muscle strength, uh, blood lactate concentration, breathing capacity. Notice all the different systems that are impacted and their relative linear declines overall. Neuromuscular uh, metabolisms on here, cardiovascular, all the systems tend to go down. And if their function goes down, their overall contributions to ability or work capacity go down as well. So all of those systems, as they decline in individual functions, they contribute to a decline in overall function. And as exercise physiologists, we like to think of overall function as uh, VO2 max, or the ability to do, to do work at higher workloads. VO2 max tends to go down or linearly over time, as you get older, VO2 max always slopes downwards. Despite being active or despite being endurance trained, no one can escape the slippery slope or the grip of aging as uh, VO2 max declines. This doesn't say, um, this doesn't highlight that you can switch between these lines. If you're a sedentary individual, you can become active and become more fit and improve your VO2 max over time, but you're still moving between these downward slopes. Sedentary, active, and endurance trained individuals all exhibit decreases in function. 
the amount to about 10% per decade after your mid-20s. I'm not going to do the math for myself right now. I'm pushing 15% decline at this point. And it only gets worse. That's encouraging. So what I, th uh, what I think is encouraging is know that you're near your peak right now, which is fantastic. It's exciting. Go get that VO2 max up. So uh, this is a, a broad look at aging in general, and uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, is one of those aspects of aging. So declining cognitive function specifically, what do we mean by a decline in cognitive function? We tend to see this manifest in, in two different ways, and I, I often will use these somewhat interchangeably, although there is some uh, separation in their definitions. Dementia. Alzheimer's dementia literally translates as without mind and whether they are the same thing or whether they are related or whether they stem from similar underlying causes I think that's still uh, arguable or debatable but I consider or I think about dementia as a, a gradual decline and, a, and an accumulation of errors in the brain Think of it as the, the metabolic syndrome of brain function, like the metabolic syndrome leads to diabetes and insulin resistance. Something similar seems to occur with cognitive function. And that's different from Alzheimer's, where it's a specific flavor of dementia or a kind of dementia. Dementia is a broad term to encompass most aspects of cognitive function. Processing, arithmetic, speech, verbal recognition, things like that. And Alzheimer's specifically is related to memory and behavior deteriorations. Sporadic bouts of memory loss, behavior is affected. Um, the person largely <coughs> changes from their normal routines and habits or as you knew them um, in their normal intact state. This tends to develop, both of these tend to develop over time, and they only really uh, appear or are exhibited later in life, over 65 years old. And so a lot of the uh, problems with newly learned information tend to occur with things that happen acutely later in life, whereas these individuals have no problem often recalling things from their past, from their 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, Long-lasting or older information tends to be easier to recall, but newly learned information, encoding that information, is really difficult. And so for our purposes, we think of um, 65 years old as the threshold. Um, this is where we consider individuals transitioning from adulthood to elderly adults or older adults. And if we observe these deficits earlier than 65 years, it's termed early onset Alzheimer's or early onset dementia. And there are some pretty uh, interesting genetic links uh, for those cases, and one or two of which we'll talk about later on. But. So broadly, dementia is an umbrella term. Alzheimer's is a specific kind of dementia. But they both refer to progressive decline in cognitive function or, uh, or brain function. Now, brain function is also difficult to really understand. There's a lot of elements that go into how our brains work and control the, uh, uh, the puppet strings that, are, uh, that attach to our body. Uh, brain function can include processing, uh, memory, attention, the ability to memor memorize or produce, learn new languages, um, problem solve, so come up with difficult situations and find a solution to them, or executive function, which we think of as being able to allocate mental resources to the areas that need them at a given point in time. It's difficult to explain each of these in turn. There are a lot of different um, aspects of brain function, and as such, there are many different tests that we can use to evaluate different areas and different whole brain functions. Uh, it's really difficult to study brain function because it's hard to access the tissue. It's hard to figure out what needs to be measured. 
It's hard to figure out which of these aspects of brain function is more important. Um, are they more important in everybody? Do some people exhibit preferences for one or the other? Does a decline in function in one translate across all individuals? How do we study brain function when there's a lot of these um, somewhat difficult to distinguish aspects that we might want to, uh, to assess? One of the standard forms that we use is called the mini mental state exam. And this is meant to be an assessment of whole brain cognitive function, all of the aspects, memory, language, processing, executive function, problem solving. And the questions are listed here. It's a 30 point scale. Uh, a score of 23 or above is good. Below 23 indicates some form of cognitive decline. Um, so this is a screening exam to categorize people loosely as uh, having cognitive impairment or not. 23 or lower is cognitive impairment, 24 and above is not. And so the kinds of questions you can see here, what um, are you aware of the current situation? Where are you? Uh, here's a list of three things and remember them. You come back to them later. Earlier I told you three things. Can you tell me what they are? After doing a few different uh, processing questions in the middle. So it's, it's switching between different aspects of brain function. It's testing recall. There's a number of questions that even we might find kind of difficult. Um, it's translating cognitive information into uh, some action. So copy this picture. Uh, try to get the, the uh, what are those pentagons overlapping and it can be quite difficult for some individuals depending on the type of cognitive decline they exhibit. So the mini mental state exam we see a fair bit in Alzheimer's research and we'll see that in the papers that we discuss next Tuesday. But this isn't the be all end all almost you can spin anything that assesses cognitive function and processing as, as being useful in this context. And some of the tests that, uh, that I've used, I, I started looking at um, how dehydration affects cognition. Because often when you're competing, you're dehydrated, you start to feel really fuzzy. And it's hard to be coordinated, and um, that might impact sport performance. It's a different realm than Alzheimer's and cognitive function in that context. But the, uh, the impact test, the immediate post-concussion or post-assessment concussion test, post-concussion assessment and cognitive testing. It's meant to uh, compare a baseline uh, to post-injury if you are a concussed individual in a team sport or an individual sport to see how your mental function, your cognitive function changes as a result of a potential injury. <clears throat> and the test here is one of six or seven different tests in a series of tests where you're presented with a number of symbols and the order changes all the time. Uh, and they're corresponded or correlated here with a number, uh, a certain number. And you have to press the number that matches the symbol that's presented at the bottom. And once you press the number, this changes to circle or some other symbol. And you go through, you press the number that correlates with this uh, presented symbol. And then at some point, this uh, series of symbols disappears. So you have to be able to execute the task initially and then we add a memory component where now you can't see the legend and you're presented with the same symbols and you have to remember what number corresponded to that symbol. And that type of test will assess uh, processing, executive function, and memory in different amounts. And then there's other tests that show you a, a list of words. This one shows you a list of symbols. At the start, you see this list of 10 different symbols, and then at the end of the test, you're asked to remember, was this one of the designs that was displayed in the list? Yes or no. Hopefully you're correct um, or not. So, so design memory, symbol memory, word memory is a similar type of test, but a different, uh, different set of, um, uh, a different set of instructions, I think. Or tests like the Stroop test that you might have seen will assess cognitive function and executive function, where you're given a, the name of a color and it's written in the written 
the letters are written in text of a different color than the word. So orange, the word is written in red lettering. And then you have to find the word red in this list at the bottom, which happens to be written in yellow lettering. And so you click on red and then this um, uh, the, the color changes. And you go on with this um, really complicated test to hopefully score high, high points. Anyways, different assessments of cognitive function that um, might test multiple aspects of brain function, emphasizing uh, executive function or memory or what have you, trying to assess the overall abilities, cognitive abilities of an individual. So we use these types of tests for healthy individuals, for concussed individuals, for aging individuals to try to determine how their cognitive function changes over time. Why would their cognitive function change over time? What is it about getting older that results in cognitive decline? What is it that we think results in the development of Alzheimer's, the loss of memory, the loss of coordination, executive function, etc.? This is ongoing hot topic research, but our understanding right now, the basic understanding that we have is that in the brain, around the neurons of the brain, we get these aggregations of plaques. Plaques are an accumulation of, of bunching uh, of proteins that are normally produced in the brain, but for some reason don't degrade. And these plaques are called beta amyloid plaques. And these are plaques, a big uh, aggregation of beta amyloid proteins. So each of these cylinders is a beta amyloid protein. Beta amyloid proteins tend to accumulate in plaques, and so we, we, we can observe those in the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's plaques. They result in uh, neurons being tangled up. There's other, other proteins that are involved as well that get hyperphosphorylated that might influence signaling. But for our purposes, they all tend to be related to these beta amyloid plaques that are accumulation of beta amyloid proteins. They're always produced in the brain normally, but we don't know why they aggregate. We have an idea, and there are some things that target and break these down that give us an idea of um, how we can help create therapies and get rid of them. The mechanism for why this occurs in the first place is not really known. It seems to generally be random. Alzheimer's disease in its uh, normal form doesn't seem to be heritable. As you get older, whether your parents or grandparents had it or not, you have a higher chance of developing Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's does have some genetic link. Appearance of the uh, beta amyloid plaques prior to 65 years old or a decline in cognitive function uh, before 65 years old seems to be at least uh, somewhat genetically related or somewhat heritable, but uh, normal quote unquote onset Alzheimer's is not. Whether these plaques form or not, we're not sure what factors it depends on, but it doesn't matter uh, about your genetics. So why would these plaques accumulate? It seems that there's a really slight mismatch in how these proteins are processed. These cylinders are always produced. And we think they're actually part of memory formation. In the process of forming memories, think of what, what is a memory, really, right? Being able to remember what you ate for breakfast or what happened last week. Neurons are firing in slightly different ways, and those connections have been made somehow for some reason, and how persistent those connections are generally relates to how strong the memory is, but even that is um, probably a very high-level glossed over description of how memories form. We think that somehow making these proteins is involved in memory formation. And so cutting out these proteins properly 
would allow us to form proper memories, recall that information, and have it exist as a memory in our brains. If we don't cut these proteins out properly, then we wouldn't create proper memories. We'd have difficulty remembering the information in a situation where this wasn't excised properly. So what is it about this processing that might result in the appearance of slightly modified beta amyloid proteins? And if those are slightly modified, do they tend to aggregate? Are they not processed and, and do they not develop memories properly? So beta amyloid proteins are cut out of what's called amyloid precursor protein. So the blue bits that are left over on the image behind the text, all of that protein put together would have been amyloid precursor protein. It's the protein that precedes the amyloid proteins. It's a transmembrane protein, that is it spans or it, it, it sits in the membrane of neurons in the brain. And we don't know what it does. Maybe it's a receptor. Maybe it's to help target other proteins and recruit them. Amyloid precursor protein is part of the neurons, and we don't know what it does. But we know that how it sits in relation to other proteins in the membrane dictates whether or not these beta amyloid proteins will be uh, produced properly. If they're produced improperly, they are too long. So the scissors, which are the enzymes that cut the protein at two different points, they sit a little bit further apart than they should. And that's the only difference. The scissors are put in place by another protein, and I'll show you an image uh, on the next slide that shows the relationship, <coughs> called presenilin. It's also in the membrane. It sidles up next to amyloid precursor protein. It positions the enzymes in place, and then it cleaves amyloid precursor protein. If presenilin is shaped incorrectly, the enzymes won't be in the right place, and the resulting beta amyloid protein will be of a different shape, or of a different length than it should be. And the difference is minuscule. The beta amyloid proteins that tend to accumulate in plaques that result in Alzheimer's disease are 42 amino acids long, and normal beta amyloid proteins that are produced to help support memory formation are 40 amino acids long. So there's two extra amino acids and a world of difference in function. That small discrepancy makes beta amyloid proteins more likely to aggregate, more likely to bunch up and disrupt neuron signaling, connections between neurons, memory formation, and cause Alzheimer's as we know it. Two amino acids. So on this slide, you can see a flow chart of the effects. You can see the two proteins sitting together in the membrane. So this is a neuron. Here's the membrane of the neuron. This is amyloid precursor protein that we want to cleave or cut out beta amyloid protein from. And then presenilin is the pink ribbon, much larger, also in the membrane. You can see it sidles right up to amyloid precursor protein, and it positions the enzymes in place to cleave that protein. Whatever the job is, why we do that, we're not exactly sure, but this is the orientation. And then that newly cleaved protein is released from the membrane. It's, um, it's uh, sent outside of the neuron where we expect it has some normal function, <clears throat> but when this is longer than it should be, it tends to make plaques. It tends to also influence oxidative injury result in neurodegenerative changes. It can also influence 
clusters of other proteins that result in those tangles that we mentioned a few uh, slides back. If this protein that's released is too long, all these downstream effects occur, and we end up with dementia or cognitive decline. Neurons start to die, they don't signal properly, and then cognition declines. I also want to point out while we're on this slide, because we'll come back to it, up here at the top, uh, apolipoprotein E is referenced or mentioned, and it has effects where it can break down these plaques. If it's working properly, it protects us against plaque formation. So apolipoprotein E is really important. And we're going to come back to that later as a um, way to understand how exercise might impact uh, cognitive function. So it should help protect us against the accumulation of these proteins, but if these proteins are too long and they're released from the neurons and they accumulate, we end up with cognitive decline. So how does exercise impact cognitive decline? That's a more appropriate title than what I have listed here. This is how does exercise impact Alzheimer's, but that's a specific example or type of cognitive decline. I want to look in general first. How does exercise affect cognitive decline? Does it? Is there any reason that we're looking at this topic right now? Yeah. In Older adults, and you'll see that a lot of the studies we look at start with a baseline of 65 years old. That's the cutoff that we identified. Regular exercise reduces the risk of dementia. So this is 65 years old individuals that don't have any indication of dementia or cognitive decline when they start the study. And then throughout the study, over 35 years, these investigators measure cognitive function and the incidence of dementia. Those that are more active have a higher probability of being dementia-free at any given point in time. Those that are more active three or more times per week, the solid line, have a higher probability of being dementia-free at any given point in time. So this isn't cause and effect, it's only incidence, it's frequency or the number of individuals that don't have dementia versus those that do. And it's still, like it's encouraging, but it's not that encouraging. Even in those individuals that are really active, by the time you reach 95, half of them have dementia. So that's still kind of scary. What we want to do is be able to push this line up even more. I'm not sure if that's possible yet. So cognitive function seems to be improved somewhat. What other markers can we look at that might be impacted? Based on our current understanding, one thing we might want to look at is the appearance of beta amyloid plaques. And we can't do it easily in humans, so we've developed mouse models. This is a mouse model, the triple transgenic mouse model that's been bred to develop Alzheimer's. And it does that early at a much higher rate than a normal mouse. And we can observe higher incidences or accumulation of beta amyloid plaques in these mice. When they exercise, beta amyloid plaques in all of the, these different regions of the brain are cut in a third to a half, or they're reduced by a third to a half. 40 to 50 percent reduction in both um, types of beta amyloid proteins, the normal healthy one and the really long one. Exercise somehow seems to reduce the formation of beta amyloid protein. Whether that means memories are reduced or just that the likelihood of plaques occurring is reduced, we're not sure. But in mice, there's a lower occurrence or a lower presentation of beta amyloid protein. And as best as we can tell in humans, something similar seems to occur. It's hard to measure beta amyloid protein in the brains of humans while they're living. 
This is plasma beta amyloid protein. The long protein that we don't like is reduced after six months of endurance exercise. 6% reduction in older adults versus a control group, 65 years of age and older, that gain 24%. What does that mean? Well, what does it mean to have beta amyloid protein in the blood? I'm not sure, really. Um, we're concerned about it in the brain. If that ever leaks out into the blood somehow through the cerebrospinal fluid, maybe these numbers mean something. But they're certainly trending in the right direction. Exercise pushes them in, into the right direction, which is good. So exercise seems to improve cognitive decline and might do it through some beta amyloid related mechanism. Beta amyloid protein is reduced with exercise in, in mice and in humans, at least in the blood. What's another potential mechanism that exercise might use to confer benefits in cognitive function? Let's take a look at apolipoprotein E. This is the protein, or um, it is a protein, that helps to prevent or break down plaque formation. Apolipoprotein E. As a lipoprotein, you know, normal lipoproteins are things in the membranes of cholesterol. Cholesterol are packages of fat that get uh, uh, produced by the liver, travel around the body, and the lipoproteins signal the tissues when they should take up the cholesterol or process the cholesterol. So as a lipoprotein, it's part of the membrane of very low-density lipoproteins, low-density lipoproteins, intermediate-density lipoproteins. Those are all the bad cholesterols. You've heard of them referred to as bad cholesterol. HDL was the good cholesterol, high-density lipoproteins. Apolipoprotein E is recognized by normal LDL receptors. <coughs> so other tissues in the body can recognize it. For some reason, it's recognized in the brain as well. And depending on the form of apolipoprotein E that you express, you will genetically express apolipoprotein E. Depending on the form that you express, it is more or less active in breaking down beta amyloid plaques. There are three forms, E2, E3, and E4. E2 is generally the best, E3 is normal, E4 is really bad at breaking down proteins, or breaking down those plaques. It's really bad at breaking down plaques, and so you would expect in individuals that genotype with apolipoprotein E4, there's a gene, the APOE gene, that you can sequence and figure out which flavor of APOE you will produce. In those with E4, it's the best genetic predictor of whether you will develop Alzheimer's disease. Those with the E4 gene have a 10 to 30 fold increased likelihood of developing Alzheimer's by 75 years old. This is the genetic determinant of Alzheimer's disease, at least that we know of right now. One of the single breast, uh, breast, single best genetic predictors of Alzheimer's disease that we've uh, been able to find. But even still, it's not the entire picture. It's not the entire picture. It's not a determinant because even some individuals that uh, are E4 negative develop Alzheimer's disease. Individuals with the good types of apolipoprotein E still develop Alzheimer's, so something else is at play. And on the flip side, some individuals that are uh, homozygotes for E4, they only express the really bad form of apolipoprotein E. Sometimes they don't develop Alzheimer's. For whatever reason. They, of course, are the exception, though, and not the rule. The, the large majority are at an increased likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. 
but it's not the be all end all. There's something else going on. So being that this is a, a, a strong genetic predictor of Alzheimer's and probably has a major role in the development of Alzheimer's, how does exercise impact apolipoprotein E's function? This is one instance where recently, instead of using mice or instead of sampling the blood, we've been able to do some in vivo amyloid imaging, which is really kind of cool. Imaging the brain directly and assessing the plaque burden is a good way to describe it. How much plaque is present? How much of a burden is there on the brain? So whether you have Alzheimer's or not, and all of these individuals do not, how likely are they to develop Alzheimer's given our assessment of the total plaque burden? So here, a larger bar means more of a plaque burden. A lower bar means less of a plaque burden. So we want a small bar, if at all possible. What we're looking at is apolipoprotein E genotyping with or without exercise. So on the left two bars, you see individuals that are E4 negative. That is, they express the good types of E4. Or sorry, they express the good types of apolipoprotein E. They're negative for E4. E is the, E4 is the bad type. And as you would expect, their plaque burden is generally small. The right two bars are individuals that express apolipoprotein E4 the bad kind of apolipoprotein E that doesn't break down plaques very well. And certainly in one of those cases, they respond as you would expect. You have E4, you're not breaking down plaques, you should probably have a lot of them. And that is the case for non-exercisers. Surprisingly and encouragingly, exercisers that express E4 have a completely normalized plaque burden. For some reason, exercise seems to help the degradation of these plaques in the brain. Even in the worst case scenario where they're most likely to accumulate, exercise normalizes the plaque burden. So it's good news for E4 positive individuals. What's also really good news, even in Individuals with normal apolipoprotein E, there's still a reduction. Notice that on the left. Exercise still makes this bar smaller, still reduces the plaque burden. So whatever the mechanisms are, exercise seems to benefit um, Alzheimer's in that plaque burden is reduced. There are fewer beta amyloid plaques in the brain in exercise. It's really difficult to decode this kind of information. What does it mean for exercise to impact beta amyloid plaque burden? What does it mean to try to assess and image the brain? What does it mean to measure brain function? The brain is one of the, uh, one of the organs where structure really underpins function. This is one of the organs where those two are almost um, one-to-one -one, tightly linked. Structure, that is the size of a brain region, generally means there are more neurons, more connections, and that usually means that it functions better. So a larger brain area typically means better brain function. A smaller brain area typically means worse brain function. And so as we're trying to understand the development of Alzheimer's and, and how the brain is affected by aging in general, it's interesting to look at changes in, in shape and structure and size of different areas of the brain. And in a broad survey, this isn't Alzheimer's specific, this is age related. Looking at those areas that seem to be really susceptible to aging. Maybe they're, they're involved in Alzheimer's disease, we're not sure. 
but these areas of gray matter and white matter tend to change the most as you get older. That is, they shrink the most as you get older. The lighter the area um, on this scale, the, the more yellow and more white it is, the larger the shrinking, the, the more that area shrinks. And somehow, we don't know how these are related at all, there seems to be an overlap in where exercise helps protect tissues of the brain. These areas also seem to be improved or enhanced by exercise. That is, they grow in response to exercise. Structure improves, function improves. The more light blue or green these areas are, the greater um, the change, the more they tend to grow with exercise. And there's an overlap where those same areas that decline with age tend to be protected by exercise. really interesting to see that there's this one-to-one -one overlap. It doesn't talk about Alzheimer's, doesn't talk about beta amyloid plaques. This is a very general whole brain view, if you will, of the protection afforded by exercise in the face of aging. Linking structure and function is, is difficult though. What we have on the last slide is that structure changes. It goes down with age, it goes up with exercise, but we don't know if that means anything as far as memory is concerned, as far as processing is concerned. We're assuming that structure dictates function, but it's difficult to link the two. So this one-year follow-up study tried to do just that, looking at brain imaging over time and then assessing various aspects of function. I'm showing you one area of the brain only, but many different areas were assessed in this study. The hippocampus, because we looked at this in the uh, depression section as well, shown here, the yellow highlighted areas. We're looking at volume or size, total volume of the hippocampus, and changes over time. The left and right hippocampi are slightly different, perhaps because of the handedness of the individuals, we're not sure, but importantly, the size tends to go up in both cases with exercise, whereas the control group, the hippocampal volume, goes down over a year. So light stretching, no exercise, it tends to be atrophy of the hippocampus in these older individuals as they age. Exercise protects against that atrophy and boosts the size of the hippocampus. Now, whether it's a correlation or not, we also observe positive changes in VO2 max. Of course, you'd think exercise should help improve fitness. There's a, a tight correlation between <clears throat> changes in volume of different brain areas and the change in VO2 max. We also observe an increase in circulating BDNF release. We talk about that in the depression section. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor that helps with branching. More volume means more neurons, more BDNF means more connections between those neurons, and hopefully a better function. Also an improvement in task performance. So greater brain volume, greater fitness, greater memory performance, all of these things happen at the same time with exercise. We're not sure which is the cause and which is the effect, but that all of them occur, I think, is still a pretty good argument for using exercise as a therapy to protect against the effects of aging. Now let's look at cognition and Alzheimer's specifically. We looked at um, general function and age-related decline. How do processing skills and tasks change with exercise. Good news is that tests of executive function, tests of spatial reasoning, velocity tests, verbal reasoning and memory all go up. This is a meta-analysis of um, 
sedentary, healthy, older adults, not sorry, not sedentary, healthy, older adults <laughs> stratified based on whether they are sedentary or whether they exercise in the exercising individuals, there's a much larger effect for improved cognitive aspects. There's not one, um, there's not one test that can assess all of these, so we're looking at many different areas. One of the studies that we, uh, we look at on, on Tuesday has a really lengthy write-up of so many different cognitive tests to try to get a, a really whole brain approach or an assessment of cognitive function. It's really quite interesting. So processing, speed, executive function all tend to go up. In healthy adults, what does it do in adults with Alzheimer's disease? Perhaps the first look at how exercise impacts Alzheimer's disease shows pretty promising results. Attention, um, verbal memory, different tests of, of verbal acuity, the mini mental state exam, which we looked at at the start. These are all assessments of normal cognitive function, which should be reduced with Alzheimer's. They're all improved with exercise in patients that have Alzheimer's. So exercise benefits healthy individuals. It also benefits people that have pre-existing cognitive decline. Attention goes up, many mental state scores go up. Notice they're still not free and in the clear. 23 was our cutoff to diagnose a cognitive impairment. They're still considered as having a cognitive impairment, but a two and a half point increase is pretty encouraging after only three weeks of exercise training. These are almost too good to be true. And a whole host of other studies have, have looked at these results, have kind of taken up the torch. Alzheimer's patients improve. Individuals with cognitive decline, not full-blown Alzheimer's, tend to improve as well. Instead of three weeks of exercise, we're looking at a six-month intervention between stretching as a control and then moderate exercise three days per week. These are older adults, 55 to 85 years old, and these are changes from baseline. You've got the Stroop test on the left. That was the color word association test that we looked at before. Trails B is, a, is an interesting test where you're, you're shown a piece of paper and it has numbers one through 26 and letters A through Z and you have to draw one continuous trail, A, 1, B, 2, C, 3, D, 4. And so we're measuring time to complete that task, which can be kind of confusing <coughs> for some individuals. Pretty much in all cases, after six, month, uh, six months, if you were in the stretching control group, your performance worsened. It got slower. Stroop response was slower, trails test was slower, and the exercise group, it improved across the board. It's only a significant difference for women doing the Stroop test, but there's still a really nice trend in all of these cases. So we did three weeks, six months, what about a six-year longitudinal study? And I, I apologize, this slide's not in the slide set on Moodle. I just wanted to bring this up to show you the differences in the groups really quickly. Does exercise benefits, do they persist over six years? Looking at the, uh, the individuals, they're not technically uh, impaired. They have lower scores than, than perfect. They're not 30 out of 30, but they are above the threshold of 23. At least they're all equal in these three tertiles. Tertiles based on fitness, low, medium, and high fitness. At six years, these older individuals, depending on your fitness, exhibited a greater decline in cognitive function. The higher your VO2 max, the less of a decline in function. Somehow fitness protects against cognitive decline over six years. 
This is um, from the the twenty three or the twenty what was it twenty four on the last on the last graph. This is a decline in mini mental state exam performance. It dropped by 0.55 in the lowest fitness group. It dropped by 0.25 in the middle group. It only dropped by 0.05 in the highest fitness group. But I'm going to pop back to this uh, this table for a second. But take a look at the age differences between these three groups. The most fit individuals are the youngest. They are right at that 65-year-old threshold. They haven't really had time to accumulate Alzheimer's disease. The lowest fitness group are the oldest. They've had six years to accumulate Alzheimer's disease. Lowest VO2 max are also the oldest. All are over 65, but it's progressive. The more time that you throw at it, the more likely you are to develop Alzheimer's disease. So if we adjust for age, is there a difference? Is there still a difference? Somehow there is. Even though age obscures these results somewhat, exercise still, or, or being fit, still has some protective effect. The decline, the age-adjusted decline in mini mental state exam performance over six years is still lower in the highest fitness individuals, despite them being the youngest. It's not a convincing argument, but this is one of the only studies to draw out over six years this kind of assessment in um, older individuals. Encouraging, nonetheless, having a high fitness seems to be good. It's protective. But you also have to wonder, what's the significance of a 0 0.6 change on a, th uh, this should be a 30-point scale. The MMSC is a 30-point scale. What is that, 0.05% change? What is the significance of that change on a 30-point scale? Arguably, it's quite small. The trend, though, is undeniable. So um, this sets the stage, I think, for our papers. Exercise seems to be good in maintaining brain volume, improving general cognition, improving specific aspects of cognition. It protects over six years. There's reason to believe that even if you have deterioration, that engaging in exercise can help correct some of that decline in cognitive function. Exercise seems to be really good at improving mental acuity, regardless of the baseline state. What I want to throw in just quickly, that's a bit of a tangent that's been popularized in recent years, is the idea of brain gain. My mom loves these. Got to get my brain games in. I need to exercise my brain. I don't want to lose my memory, lose my mind. Brain games, the way to go. Brain games. So the ultimate goal of brain games, and I'll show you a couple examples of these, but they're a lumosity. They're like little trivia things you do on your phone that try to um, test your processing, help improve cognition. The ultimate goal and the shortcoming is... Do improvements you see in the game translate into real life? What I'm describing is a concept called FAR transfer. Do brain games actually help cognition, or are you just practicing addition, practicing reaction time? It's difficult to quantify because Lumosity is a fairly new set of tests. They're varying tests. We don't have an established way to assess cognition in the in the game versus in real life what real life skill are you trying to assess uh, and is improved by these brain games but generally in the the little bit of research that that's out there more complex games or tasks tend to be more effective than simple games whack-a-mole type reaction games not very effective complex strategy type games where you have to imagine a few steps ahead 
tend to be better. Task switching involving many different types of cognition, problem solving, uh, complex problems, those tend to be the, the types of games that, if they're going to work, will work. Individual attributes don't seem to have much real-world benefit. And so one assessment of these games uh, came out in 2013. I think there's been a couple uh, follow-ups since then, but the, the results are still pretty interesting to look at. These are examples of uh, the games in Lumosity that we're going to talk about, and they should, they should line up with the graphs that we have on the next couple of slides. Um, I'm not going to go through in depth, but there are various types. There's arithmetic. You have to remember words and type words out that start with a, a predetermined root. You have to remember patterns. You have to hit a key in response to whether these two match and the sequence changes always over time. And the faster you go, the more points you get, the better your performance is. And the idea here is if you practice these games, you won't get dementia. You won't exhibit any cognitive decline. So is there any reason to believe that's the case? First of all, how do people perform on these games initially? And perhaps unsurprisingly, your performance is worse as you get older. This is mining Lumosity data across the entire lifespan, individuals as young as 20, individuals at 70 years and a bit older. Performance of every task tends to go down with age. Arithmetic goes down, verbal fluency, spatial memory, working memory, everything goes down with age. This is as expected. The score is not really important. What is important is the change in these scores, which is on the next slide. Let's say we do this Lumosity brain training for a month, 25 days to be specific. How do these scores change over time. We'd expect the changes to improve, to go up, and then hopefully that would translate into a real world scenario. After 25 days, these are the changes in scores. First of all, everyone went up. All of these are above zero, right? This is the change in score from day one to day 25. Anything above zero means a higher score on day 25. Everybody improved, which is actually quite good. They improved at these tasks, maybe not at everyday grocery shopping or memory or, or whatever, whatever the real life um, test would be. Everyone improved. And in a few select cases, the improvements were better in young than in old. So in these really complex type of tasks, the young individuals had a greater capacity for improvement than the older individuals. In the arguably simpler tasks, everyone had a similar capacity for improvement. But it's the complex tasks that are interesting. Young people tend to have their, their mental faculties perhaps a bit more intact, a bit more flexibility, a bit more capacity for improvement, and older individuals are resistant to improvement in these complex tasks. What that means as far as real-world benefit, we're not sure, but if complex tests are more likely to confer a benefit, it seems that older individuals are less likely to get anything out of these type of brain games. Well, it'd be really nice is to have some kind of connection between doing something, doing well on these tests, and then being able to remember family members' birthdays, or going to the grocery store and making a list of things to buy, or something in the real world. We don't have that link yet. So let's uh, briefly summarize. Alzheimer's. A lightning round brief overview that we've had in class today. What do we know about Alzheimer's disease? Um, our, our tenuous understanding says that it's related to the accumulation of plaques. Plaques arise from beta amyloid proteins that are uh, processed improperly 
and then the appearance of these these plaques can be um, detrimental to brain function and we assess brain function through various cognitive tests like the mini mental state exam uh, I didn't point this out but structure the the changes in size of brain regions with uh, aging and with exercise was done by fMRI and um, that in vivo amyloid imaging was a modified version of fMRI. So we have ways that we can assess brain function. We have an idea of why function declines. And regardless of what the mechanisms are, exercise seems to help. Exercise seems to prevent the steep decline, or maybe not prevent is the right word, minimize or blunt the steep decline. It seems to reduce amyloid protein and plaque formation. It does it in healthy adults. It does it in unhealthy adults. There seems to be a really good prospect for exercise in treating cognitive decline. If our understanding of Alzheimer's is correct and beta amyloid is at the center of its um, progression, Exercise is encouraging because it reduces beta amyloid proteins in mice, in the brains of specific targeted areas in mice, also circulating in the plasma in humans, which might indicate a reduction in the brain. We looked at in vivo plaque burden. That was reduced with exercise, even in individuals that are really susceptible to developing plaques. So we're strengthening our case for exercise as a therapy. It can't completely reverse everything, only slow the progression. At 95 years of age, 50% of individuals still had dementia, even though they were fully active, so it's important to contextualize these results. And note that exercise certainly seems impactful, but brain games aren't brain exercise. There's some other element, hormonal or energy use or uh, endocrine, muscles releasing hormones that seems to um, add to the benefits of exercise in Alzheimer's, something that brain games might not be able to uh, confer long term.